Okay, so this is a uh, video tutorial to go with my PowerPoint and PDF version for how to record asteroid occultations uh, using the Cabrillo College Astronomy Department uh, so-called second unit setup. So, um, this is intended really for my students. However, there may be new people to occultations who would like to duplicate uh, my setup since I have used several over the years and uh, I really like this one. First thing, you got to set up the tripod. So make sure the slot that's holding the scope is sloped upwards but not straight overhead. If it's straight overhead, I found that the scope gets disoriented uh, or at least it, um, it moves to places not in the direction that you would hope and since the power cord is connected to the bottom of the arm, um, that can cause problems. So I store the uh, optical tube assembly in the original box as it came from Celestron and with the railing up. So and you hoist it up and you put it into the jaws of the um, single arm uh, mount. And how you do that <coughs> is a little awkward because um, there's <laughs> you've got a you need three hands really. So you need one hand to obviously support the tube, you need another hand to tighten the knob. I generally use the same hand for both of those, so you kind of cradle it. And um, it's easy to tighten it and not actually have it in the jaws, so make sure that the screw is, is completely unscrewed almost so that you really do get it in the jaws before you start tightening it. Okay, and so there you can see how it's properly positioned and the tightener actually does have that square with the uh, uh, the dovetail mount. So now grab the smaller box, the eyepiece box, that's the one that has um, our gear that we need for visually aligning the telescope. And you open it up and you'll see our laser sight that uh, is standard with the Celestron 8SE telescopes and uh, my keep fuses in there as well. And then the two inch diagonal. So the first thing is to mount the uh, laser sight on the telescope. So this can also be a little tricky. I found it not made it as well as perhaps it could have been um, in terms of design and so forth. It's easy to get it off, off whack and then that causes a real slowdown when you're in a time crunch to try and get these occultations. So there's the dovetail rail and you grab it. Hold and you put it on and you try and get the, the fingers at the bottom of the dovetail to mate into the little depressions along the slot. And once it feels like it's about right, then you tighten it. Um, notice there's four knobs on this thing and you want to only tighten the zinc ones, the metal ones. Those are the ones that actually tighten you to the telescope. So now you screw on the Celestron inch and a quarter or, uh, yeah, the inch and a quarter visual back from the Celestron, or rather you unscrew it, excuse me, you take it off because that's normally stored with that on. And you pull out the two inch diagonal. This is the Celestron diagonal and it mounts directly onto the SCT threads at the back of the telescope. So you screw that in. Now this picture actually has the mead two inch diagonal, which I use for the first unit, the one that I usually use for asteroid events. Uh, the second one is actually with the Celestron. Then you put in the Q70 32 millimeter eyepiece. So I got these from Orion. They give a nice wide field of view. I like this eyepiece a lot. Fairly affordable too, certainly more affordable than those high quality uh, Naglers. But yeah, it gives a nice wide field of view and that's what we really want. So before lining, we need to be sure the scope is stable. So now that we've got all the, the gear on it, it's time to push those tripod tips down into the ground and make sure that it's very stable. So as you walk around, you're not gonna be causing the scope to shift. So any shifting, then your pointing ability is gonna be compromised. And even if you do manage to find what you want, it may not track perfectly and then you'll get drift during the recording, which is, um, which is not good. Okay, now we have our second box. I call it Ock Box 2. 
and it's a Husky 16 inch two level toolbox from Home Depot. Uh, if I were doing this all over again, maybe I'd get the 19 inch, although they didn't have that at Home Depot when I first bought this. And uh, anyway, the 16 inch is a little smaller and it, it does the, do the job. Um, I keep the wires in sandwich bags and that's to avoid getting them tangled up. Uh, doing everything efficiently and without tangles and without pulling stuff out is really essential because I find that I'm always a little late to these things. I don't allow enough time and I'm kind of in a time crunch. And if you're the same way, then, uh, you know, that could, could wreck your occultation. So I've also had trouble with blowing fuses, and one easy way to do that is to hot plug in any component. So to hot plug means to plug in a component while the battery is already connected. So you absolutely don't want to do that. Make sure that the battery is off. Um, you'll see that later in the show here. And just plug in these cold plugs before they're plugged into the battery. Make sure the telescope is powered off, so that means the zero has been pushed on the mount side here. So we use a 14 amp hour 12 volt DC AGM battery that I got from Batteries Plus and that powers all the components and that's at the bottom of Lockbox 2. Um, now to try and especially guard against uh, blown fuses I've bought a couple of triple sockets from uh, made by LED Innovations and what these do is they have a push button which will simultaneously power on all three outlets so that you can have this thing controlled, plugged into the battery, and yet there won't be any power to your equipment until you push those buttons. It's a little more elegant than muscling on a barrel plug and perhaps um, touching something at the moment it shouldn't be touched and getting a, um, a, a surge in current and blow our fuses. So there are actually two of these LED Innovations triple sockets. There's one on each side of the battery, and they're secured with a hose clamp, as you can see. So if you raise the top level of the uh, Ockbox 2 just a little, then you'll see down into it, and you'll see the uh, plugs that are in there. So what you want to do is, um, well, so this is how it is when you first um, first pull it, pull it open. So nothing is connected yet. You don't see any power. <clears throat> now what you want to do is to push the button. So that powers on all three of those outlets. And you'll see the triple socket rim will glow a bluish purple. So that's your signal that you do have battery power going to those sockets. If it doesn't glow purple, then you might be in big trouble. So we don't know. Maybe the triple socket is fried. Um, I've had that happen. Is there a burnt smell? That's always a bad sign. Maybe the leads worked loose from your battery terminals, or maybe you just haven't connected the, uh, the negative lead back to the battery. So I'm recommending that at the end of your adventure here, you pull off the negative lead, so that'll prevent any inadvertent power. Notice that even if it's permanently connected to the power, that because those blue rims can come on even though you know you have no equipment going you can slowly drain the battery actually not that slowly um, I've just had that happen recently and notice my 12 volt battery was down to 4 volts and it was only because the uh, the blue rims were glowing underneath the top level there and I didn't notice it so if you did blow uh, one of the fuses then you're going to need to replace the fuse so each of the male connectors, 12 volt here, does have an unscrewable tip to it. And you want to look carefully at the fuse. If it's a glass fuse, which I prefer, then you can actually see whether it's blown. Um, that's good. Uh, there's also the ceramic fuses, but you won't be able to tell if it's blown unless you connect it to a voltmeter and put it on ohms and see that you get zero ohms. Then it's a good fuse. If you get an open, that means it's blown. So these um, uh, equipment-oriented uh, fuses take the, um, the long 5-amp fuses. You can get those out of the little box. Now, first thing you should notice when you push that button and powered up the equipment is you should see your IOTA VTI, your video time inserter, come on. So first of all, what will 
light will be the red light. That's the power light. There's also a green light, but that typically takes a few seconds to come on and it'll pulse while it's trying to acquire satellites and then after it's it's happy then it'll just glow a constant green. So now you're ready to power on the scope and to get your scope aligned. So the first thing you do is pull off the lid. I like to wait as long as possible to pull off the lid if there's any dampness in the air at all because otherwise that corrector plate will collect dew on it and out in the field it's really not that easy to get rid of that dew. Okay, so now you're going to want to align the laser finder with the telescope. And the first thing you do is power it on, so that's the little switch there. Um, common thing people do is, my students, is to not power that off. And then you drain the little CR2032 battery, and those are kind of expensive to replace. Um, so you don't want to do that. Make sure when you power off at the end that you uh, take that off, turn that off. But now you're going to want to turn it on. So uh, now we have the scope paddle and it's in its cradle and the power to the scope we're ready to uh, to turn that on so um, after you um, excuse me so this should already be plugged in at this point um, I just sort of reused the previous slide but what you're going to want to do now is turn on the switch and that means push it to one so you'll see the Celestron hand paddle come on and first of all it'll say verify packages um, that's something it automatically does and in a couple of seconds you're ready to hit enter and begin the alignment process so you want to scroll down you see the scroll buttons um, on the right side about halfway down the paddle so you're going to scroll down until you get to auto two star so that's the method we use for aligning And if you're doing auto two star, then it'll probably ask you the time. So you need to enter the local time, the local clock time. That includes whether there's daylight saving time. Just use your watch time. But it's important that this be accurate. So I don't want your clock to be off by more than a few seconds for proper tracking. So enter the time. And you just enter numbers one after another. You don't, do not hit the enter key until you have entered the entire time. Um, now, normally for me it doesn't ask for the longitude and latitude, although when I first got this set up it did. Um, so it probably won't ask you for this, but if it does, then enter the longitude and latitude in a similar way you did for the time. It doesn't have to be super accurate. Uh, to a minute or two is plenty good enough, probably even less is good enough. And what you're going to do now is you're going to manually aim the telescope at two bright stars that are in its database, and that will complete the alignment process. So it'll ask you for the first star. Uh, what I typically use is Polaris if I can. So if Polaris is behind a tree and you can't use it, well, then use some other star. But certainly it needs to be a star that you know. So that's the kind of the first requirement is you need to know some of your bright stars. And you need to know them by their proper names, not by the... Uh, Greek alphabet constellation name. So you scroll down through the star list till you find the star you want. And when you find the star, then you slew to it. You hit enter and then you slew to your star. So the way you slew the scope is with these little arrow keys up near the top. And left, right, up, and down should be obvious. It's an altazimuth scope, so there's no confusion with north, south, east, west. This is up, down, left, and right. Um, you should make sure at this point that you have plenty of slack in the power cord at the scope since the arm does rotate with the scope as I mentioned before. And it's possible the scope may decide to rotate the long way around in azimuth and if you strain or pull out the power cord that'll be bad. You have to start over. Um, as a general rule, I like to position the initial setup so that the azimuth the scope is roughly aiming towards my target. And then I set up my gear table 
accordingly so that it's convenient and I can still stand behind the scope but have the gear close to the back of the scope. So now you're about ready to uh, start slewing to your target star, your first alignment star. It should automatically have defaulted to the fast motor speed. You shouldn't have to worry about that. Um, just in case somehow it's not, the way you change the motor speed is in the lower left there you push the motor speed button and then right after that you push a number. Nine is the fastest, five is very very slow. Suitable only for once you have something within the LCD chip of the uh, video camera. So when the red laser finder dot is on your chosen star, hunt for it in the eyepiece and get it centered well. So I like to use Polaris as my star number one because Polaris of course doesn't drift. Um, and then while I'm getting things fine-tuned, uh, I don't have to worry about the star drifting. You really do want it as dead center as your, your eye can tell um, in order to get good uh, tracking and also to get good targeting on your, your faint asteroid occultation star. So I adjust the position of the laser dot so it agrees with the IP centered star. So how do you do that? So this is the adjusters. This is the adjusters on the laser pointer. Um, the bottom one goes up and down and that one takes it left and right. So adjust those two until the laser dot is on your star. So now that your first star is centered in the eyepiece, you click enter and then you click align. So that's the button on the left. So it will then ask you for the second star. So you, you decide on a first or second magnitude star. I like to pick one that is close to my target, uh, as reasonably close as possible. Scroll on the hand paddle gets you to a list and so you can find your second star and you hit enter. Uh, the telescope will now automatically slew to that star. If somehow it goes wildly off, and once in a while I've had that happen, um, something's gone wrong. Either the time is off in the hand paddle or the longitude and latitude is off. Um, yeah, anyway, I hope that doesn't happen. Shouldn't. Uh, you use the scope positioning arrows now to get the last slide. Um, to the last star to center on the laser dot and then in the eyepiece. Then you hit enter, then you hit align, one right after the other. The keypad should now say alignment successful. So if not, then you have to start the alignment over. Pick two different stars. Maybe it didn't like the two that you had. So I have had trouble sometimes when my view of the sky is limited or maybe I'm a little lazy and I pick two alignment stars that are not that far apart, maybe only 30 degrees or something like that and that is kind of like solving two solving for the intersection of two lines that are almost parallel you get a really bad solution and I've then not been able to find a target star so I actually lost an occultation that way that I tried to do in the quick and dirty on my deck outside my living room here and uh, so I learned the hard way that you don't do that try and pick your second star as far away from the North Star and as close to your target as you can. Okay, time to slew to your occultation target star. So you pull out the Q70 eyepiece finder chart. It's the one with a big circle field of view. Print on it. Um, I've printed on it the RA and deck for the target. And sometimes I'll do nearby stars as well that uh, might be better to try and find if your target's out in the middle of nowhere. This particular example here is in the Milky Way, so there's lots of bright stars nearby. So how do you actually enter the RA index? So here's how you do that. You click the menu and then click scroll down. So one, you hit menu and then you scroll down the menu with the down scroll key and you go down five or six levels to get to uh, go to RA deck. So that's the one right after get RA in deck. That's not the one you want. You want go to RA in deck and then you hit enter. So it's important that there be reasonably bright stars like 10th magnitude or brighter in your field of view because after you get this all positioned you're going to need to focus it. And if you don't have any bright stars in there it will be very hard to see stars until you're perfectly focused. It's much easier 
to know you're going in the right direction if you uh, actually have bright stars in there that'll show up even as big fat donuts when they're out of focus. So now you enter the RA and DAC coordinates. So there's a couple of things to watch for in that. You enter the RA hours, minutes, and seconds, one after the other, one number after another, and don't hit enter until you've hit all of them. So you may not want to enter the decimal because you don't really need it, but you'd better enter decimal because it'll be waiting until you do. After you hit enter, now it's waiting for the declination. So the first thing on the declination is the sign. So it's plus for northern, minus for southern. If the sign's incorrect for where you want to go, um, then you're going to have to hit the scroll button to reverse the sign. If it's correct as is, then just go ahead and hit enter. Now you type in the declination. So it'll leave you room for putting in the degrees, the minutes, and the seconds. Then you hit enter, and the, the scope will now automatically slew to that position. So it's important that the position be the position as of the date. So in other words, we do have precession going on, and that will affect what the scope sees. So um, I found I get more accurate pointing if I use the of date um, RA and DEC. <coughs> so now, at this point, you should see at least some of the stars from the Q70 eyepiece finder chart in your eyepiece. So my experience is that the eight SCs go to is pretty good, as long as you choose alignment stars that are far apart. So when a brightish star near the center is um, in, near in the eyepiece is centered, it's time to remove the two inch diagonal and the Q70 eyepiece so that now the back of the scope looks bare. And then get the F3.3 focal reducer from the Ockbox. Now, the clearance between the OTA and the mount base is not large enough to accommodate the preferred optical train, which is to use the F3.3 reducer and a 1.25 inch to C adapter, and then the Watec 910 with the uh, AV and the power cords coming out the back end of it. That's just too long a train, and it'll bang against the bottom of the, sc of the scope base. So this is a problem if the scope must be aimed at an altitude greater than 72 degrees. Fortunately, most occultations are at an altitude of less than 72 degrees, and so you won't have to worry about this. But if it is higher than 72, um, we've got a solution for that. But I'm going to assume for the moment that your target's altitude is lower than 72 degrees. So this is the procedure we follow in that case. So before we screw the F3.3 onto the telescope, we first screw onto the, um, the Mead visual back. So we screw the Mead F3.3 and the visual back together, and then that just minimizes the amount of time you have to spend screwing both of those together onto the back of the scope. And the reason is because uh, your scope is now pointed accurately at what you want. So you don't want to jar it. So now's the time to be very careful about screwing things on and off. So now I get the Watec video camera from the back canvas camcorder uh, case. So that's shown here. So it's in the side pocket inside that little bag. And it's uh, very expensive, so be careful with it. Um, it does have a remote control for going through the menus on it, which is very nice, except that it's connected to the camera itself with a very flimsy wiring. So again, it's easy to pull. So you want to pull off the cap now to the Watec. So that will leave the chip itself exposed to space and to dust and so forth. So you want to be very careful. Screw on the Astromania inch and a quarter adapter and gently insert to the visual back like this. Now, in order for it to agree with my star charts, then you are going to want to position this accurately. So you want the, the brass RCA jack to be on the upward side and the Watec label on the left side, as you see in this picture. So here you are looking at the back of the camera after it's been properly put in. 
Now, this is uh, a few slides to, or a slide or two to help you. If the target star is higher than 72 degrees, then there's not enough room to have the WATEC clear the Celestron mount base. So in this case, you're gonna have to swap out the two inch diagonal and Q70 eyepiece as we did before. And instead, you're gonna screw on the visual back directly with no F3.3 F3 reducer. So you're not gonna use the F3.3 reduction. Then you're gonna insert the inch and a quarter diagonal into the end of the visual back so that that'll give you the right angle to um, put the rest of the equipment on. You're gonna screw the short nose piece onto the Watek. So there are two nose pieces, a short one and a long one. The long one's the Astromania one. There's a short one, which is uh, made of plastic, and that's the one you're gonna to wanna to use now. And then screw the high point 0.5X focal reducer onto the end of that nose piece. So you, this is why you wanna use the short nose piece, because you're not gonna get good focus if you try and put the focal reducer on the end of the long one. So you insert the Watek and the nose piece and the 0.5X all together into the end of the diagonal, perpendicular to the optical axis of the scope now. And in this configuration, you've got to twist the Celestron focuser about one full turn clockwise. So in the normal configuration, when the star is less than 72 degrees, to get focus, you're going to be twisting counterclockwise by about one turn. But in this configuration, you have to screw about one full turn on the Celestron um, you know, focuser knob in the clockwise direction. The field of view turns out to be fairly similar in both cases, but you get better opti optical quality, I find, with the F3.3 and with the little 0.5x. Um, the Optical aberrations are a little worse. The stars don't focus quite as well. Okay, so now this is the way your Ockbox 2 uh, look, looks, the top lid, when you first open it. And so you've already pulled out um, the F3.3 reducer and the power cables to the video are now in this bag here. And the power to the scope, of course, that's already deployed. But what I want you to notice on this picture is a little video audio cable, which is in the middle of the picture. And that's what's gonna go into your camcorder. So now you pull out the camcorder. Um, the nice thing about these ZR45MC camcorders and other of the Canon camcorders is that you can use these strictly as a recording device and not as a, a camera. So we're using it here as just a recording device. It just records the mini DV uh, onto mini DV, the, um, the occultation. Okay, so you're gonna pull that out and then there's the remote control. Pull that out too. And then you're gonna place the camcorder onto the top lid of the Ockbox 2. And so you're gonna put it this way and note the video jack. So we're gonna plug that into Plug that into the yellow hole, so that's right here. Uh, you may have to flip open the gray cover to, to get to it. You probably will, actually. Goes into the yellow hole, so notice the yellow bands on the jack and the yellow hole, so that's a good clue that that's the proper mating. Now to see the LCD screen, you unlatch it. Flip it out, rotate it up a little, bit, a little bit so that it's facing your face. And now you're gonna be powering up the camera, but first of all, you're gonna to wanna to verify that the Watek power plug is off. In fact, you should do that before you plug anything into the Watek. So there again, is um, how you get to the power plug. You're gonna have to lift this off. Now we put the brass video into uh, the, the video RCA jack and the power plug as shown. So you lift the Ockbox 2 lid and you push the left side triple socket power. And you should see a blue glow again. If you don't see the blue glow, that's bad. That means there's no power to your Watek. Probably you've blown a fuse. You're gonna have to pull out that uh, plug, the male plug that you see at the top of this photo and replace the fuse and try again. 
So then you turn on the ZR45 camcorder. Now, don't push the red button. The red button uses it as a camera. We're using it only as a recorder. So to use it only as a recorder, you just push in that little teeny narrow gray button and pull down gently on that lever. And that's what puts it into the record position. And you should see something like this on the LCD screen of the camcorder. Um, and I should say you should make sure the battery level looks good. So before I give these to students, I'll typically try and charge them up. Um, a longer term project is to get another charger, complete charging system so that uh, I can just distribute that to wh whomever I'm giving this to for occultations. If you do run out of power, there are two spare batteries. Each battery nominally should last about an hour. Um, there's two spare batteries in the side pocket there. So now that we have the camcorder um, powered up and we have the uh, Wattec powered up, then we're ready to actually look and see what the uh, telescope sees. So what you do is you push the little record pause button. It's the red button there. Um, so you push that first, and then you should see something like this. So on this screen, you see a couple of bright stars. The target star is extremely dim. That's uh, fairly typical. And you might see a message up top, a two-line message about Almanac updated. So you probably will see that, actually. Um, so this is a time to, to realize that the, the reason that I've got two separate of those LED innovation um, uh, power, power arrays, three plugs each, is because we don't want to power up the Wattec until we actually need it. It's a delicate, expensive thing, and I don't want to power it until we're actually going to use it. But the uh, IOTA VTI needs to be powered up right away because it needs at least 15 minutes in order to not only acquire the satellites, but also to update the internal almanac that uh, gets it to correct for the proper changes to delta T, which is the offset between atomic time and astronomical time <coughs> um, that's needed for uh, proper recording of the true time, proper UT time. So you'll probably see that message up top, and it's not recorded to the tape, but it is annoying because it takes up a lot of real estate on the tape there, and so um, I'll typically uh, get rid of it, and the way you get rid of it is you push the little black button on the back side of the VTI. So that requires you to pull up the top again of the Ockbox 2 and reach in with two hands and gently pull out the VTI just a little bit so you can access that black button. And you, it's on the extreme left side of the back. And you push that button, and that'll reset, and it'll take off that message. Um, I'm a little hesitant, frankly, to recommend you do that because with all the power buttons and things, I, I don't want you to lose power. You know, if you lose power anywhere to, for example, the VTI or something else, then you're, um, you're going to have to start over. I typically, unfortunately, don't ever allow perfectly enough time. I don't spend a whole night on these things. I usually only allow an hour after I get there to power up all my equipment. And uh, I know a lot of people don't approve of that, but... Um, you know, I got a busy life. What can I say? And the problem is if you don't do this correctly, then you have to start over and then you lost a lot of time. <clears throat> so you might just want to leave that message there. If it's not bothering you, if you think you can confidently set your levels and identify your star field per perfectly well, you might just want to leave that alone. So now we need to ensure the proper settings on the Watec 910HX camera. You probably won't have to do this if you're a student of mine listening to this because I'll have already done all this for you. But uh, this tape is going out on YouTube and somebody else who's uh, buying fresh, uh, this is just a handy way to tell you what the proper settings are to use for the Wattec 910HXRC for occultations. So there's our control panel. And you hit the Enter key to activate whatever the highlighted line is that you see on the LCD screen. 
of your camcorder. Um, the up and down arrow takes you up and down on the menu. Um, and the return and exit key uh, leave you, leaves your setup altogether so that you go to the next level. So the actions that you initiate this way happen immediately. So that'll be convenient, for example, in changing the shutter integration. So you'll, you'll know that you can see your target star and it's not too bright or saturated. Yeah. So again, most of these settings uh, only need to be done the first time when you first power up your, your camera, and I've already done them for the 910HX for Cabrillo College here. But in case you haven't, there you go. Um, so you're in the setup, and exposure is one that you will be using no matter whether you're with Cabrillo or not. But these other menu um, items you'll want to adjust the first time as well. So 3DNR should be turned off. The wide dynamic range should be turned off. And then use the up arrow to get back to the exposure and press enter to bring up a new menu. So you want um, the automatic gain control to be off. You want background lighting to be off. Uh, the, the goal here is what you want is nice, perfect, linear, photometric accuracy coming off your camera and visibility of the object you're going to take care of with integration. And uh, the prime goal here is to get good photometry. Okay, so manual gain you're going to set to maximum. That's 41 dB. And then return and then return again level. Um, to get to the adjust menu, um, set gamma to 1, so that's what good photometry requires. And then the, the level, set that to 7.5 RRE, so that's a standard that we, we stick with. Now you're ready to use the shutter integration level, and this is something that Cabrillo students uh, and everyone else, of course, um, want to be changing, and they'll be changing those for each occultation and even probably during um, setup for each occultation. So you navigate to the exposure level and you press enter, and that'll bring up a s the next menu, and that's topped by shutter. And shutter integrations, um, so to clarify, a frame is a combination of two fields, and the even numbered horizontal interlaced fields. Um, well, the, so there are two fields. The first is an even, the even numbered horizontal interlaced fields, and the second field is the odd horizontal interlaced lines. Um, the two consecutive line, uh, fields put together make a full frame. I always find this confusing, fields and frames. Anyway, a frame is both the even and the odd lines together, and so you get all of the video data. Think of the field as having only half of the video data. So the Watek 910HX will integrate fields and frames within the camera before outputting. So this is really good because it allows you to see faint target stars. You can go up to a full four seconds of integration. I've never gone that high. That really compromises your time resolution, so you certainly are not going to want to go that high unless you're doing, I don't know, some occultation of some incredibly dim Kuiper belt object, and uh, you know it's so important that even four second accuracy is good enough to, to be meaningful. But normally you're going to be want to want to be on the lowest number of integrations you can get away with. So you want your target star to be visible, consistently visible, but not bright. And the reason you don't want it bright is because then you may be saturating some of the pixels, and this will degrade the photometric accuracy. So go as short an integration as you can and still reliably see the target star. For ninth or 10th magnitude stars with this setup, X2 is, um, is usually good. X2 means you're doing one field plus one field, and therefore that's a total of one frame. And that's 30 frames a second, so that's a pretty good uh, time resolution. Um, sense up should be off. I may not have said that before. 
So sense up should be off. Then with the shutter highlighted, press the Enter key, and you can use the up and down arrows to cycle between the different integrations. So the below image starts with uh, EI, but you'll want X2 and maybe up to X64. So EI is automatic exposure, and you definitely don't want that. Um, that may be okay for grazes, but um, not for occultations. So it's a, um, um, yeah, so what do you want to use? So that's going to be kind of up to you. Again, I gave you the criteria. So after you've got it set right, you want to navigate to return and then exit. Um, the other thing you need to make sure of is that there's at least one other star in the field that is roughly similar to your target star to get good um, to get good photometry. Usually if it's just a little bit brighter, that's kind of ideal. You might also need a tracking star. Frankly, the tracking star and the comparison star could be the same star. But th the point is you don't want to position things so that all you have in there is your target star. So you need at least one other star for comparison and or tracking. And again, that's why you don't want to have this thing drift too much while you're taking data. Okay, so now we're ready to focus the telescope uh, for the Watek camera that's on there. So if the star is less than 72 degrees altitude and you've got the standard configuration on there, then you need to turn the knob counterclockwise Go very slowly, um, I mean not incredibly slowly, but go reasonably slowly for about one full turn and certainly by then you should see stars begin to get uh, focused enough that you see them as small donuts. So what's annoying is sometimes if you have a star out in the middle of nowhere and it's really dim, you know, somewhere near the galactic pole and, um, and you're not sure which direction to focus and it won't be visible your star until you're already exactly at focus. So in that case, you definitely have to go very slow. If you're in the 72 degrees and above configuration, then you're going to go the opposite direction. You're going to go clockwise. And again, about one full turn. There are hot pixels on these cameras. And don't be fooled. Those are not stars. The way you can tell that they're not stars is there'll be just a single pixel. It'll look suspiciously too well focused. And even more dead giveaway is that when you turn the focus button, they won't change. So those are just little confusers that are going to come up when you uh, try and do this and also when you try to reduce it. Um, for really bright events, like for example, the Eros occultation that I'm getting ready to do tomorrow, the uh, star is 6.7 magnitude, that's really bright. So you're going to definitely want to be on the lowest integration, and that would be X2, and even then you're probably going to be a little saturated, but um, that's okay. Um, now, if you've allowed plenty of time, and you certainly should if this is your first time doing an occultation, then it's really important to save camcorder battery life. I don't really know how long those batteries are going to last. Of course, battery life gets shorter and shorter as time goes on. Even at optimum, those uh, standard batteries only last a little over an hour. So you're going to want to turn it off once you've got everything set. Uh, before you do that, you should monitor while you have this position properly and make sure that it doesn't drift. And if it does drift, make sure and take a note how it's drifting, and that'll determine sort of subjectively how long you can leave this turned off before you have to turn on again and get it repositioned. Now how long to record the occultation? I usually go a minute before and a minute after the occultation. Um, that's a very general rule. If it's a very small asteroid moving quickly then you don't have to go that far if you already know exactly that you're dead on target. Still, I, I'd like to do a minute. Um, for reductions, it's actually good to have a good baseline for photometry. So uh, I will say, yeah, always do at least a minute. If it's a very large asteroid and the total occultation lasts for 10, 20, 30 seconds, then you use another rule, and that is that there might be moons out there, and that would be a really valuable thing to discover. And they can be as far as 10 times 
the diameter of the asteroid as a general rule. So 10 diameters away is 10 times the duration of the predicted duration of the asteroid occultation itself. You might be looking at an event who's got a very poor time accuracy, like a, a KBO occultation, and that would also perhaps force you to, to go much longer. But these files are going to be large, many gigabytes, so um, I don't like to go any longer than I have to. Okay, so you got your event. Now it's time to click pause on the camcorder remote to halt recording. Um, I should say that um, after you've pushed on the blue or the uh, the red record pause button, you're not actually recording until you hit the pause button. And the pause button is actually a, a toggle, so it pauses and unpauses. Uh, if you pause, then it's still on, but it's not recording. And if it stays paused for too long, then it'll actually shut off after about two or three minutes automatically. Uh, if you're on if you're on pause and you need to stop it altogether, then you can unpause it. It'll be recording a little bit, and then you can turn it off altogether. So at this point, you may want to record the longitude and latitude. That is um, directly from the GPS unit. Frankly, that's not essential if you already know exactly where you are, because we've done tests and found that Google Earth coordinates are darn good and just as good, really, as the VTI. So, um, but anyway, um, I, I usually do this because it's a good check. What you do is uh, you need to change the setting on the VTI, and that's on the middle, on the front. If you switch that uh, down, from, or you switch it from down, which is when you get time put onto the bottom of your screen, to up, then uh, you'll actually have it display longitude and latitude and other information. And you just briefly record that for a few seconds, and then you can pause again and turn it off. Now if you want to review your tape, um, and that's a good thing to do if it's very cold um, or wet. So it is, these ZR45 MC recorders can be persnickety when it's very cold or very wet. Um, it can look like you're recording. You're going to see something on the LCD screen and yet it's not recording. Uh, to make sure you actually have recording, then you push the back arrow to rewind the tape a few seconds and then push play and it'll play it. So if you're doing this, absolutely do not hit the red record pause button again because then you're going to record right over your event and you're going to lose the data. So when you're done, you flip up the uh, button switch on the back of the camcorder and that turns it off. Plug on or unplug everything, put it back into the corresponding plastic bags, pull the ground wire off of the Ockbox 2 14 amp hour heavy battery at the bottom of the box. These are about how long you should get. Now this is with a fresh battery. None of our batteries are totally fresh. I don't really know how long you're going to get off of the 800 milliamp hour battery, which is standard. We do have three of them, so that's good, but um, you're certainly not going to want to run a power in, during the middle of your event. It, that could be, um, you know, a loser for your event. Uh, so longer term, I'm going to try to get uh, a, a larger battery for this unit. And if you're interested in putting this system together yourself from scratch, then here's a list of all the parts and the rough costs. So for less than $3,000, you can have your own setup. Okay, so I hope this has been helpful for you, my students. If uh, you're still confused, then give me an email, and I'll try and get it straight. Thanks.